as I sat in my office uh, just up the street from here. And I watched our president go to the Rose Garden and declare that he was going to leave the Paris Agreement. Um, I had perhaps a surprising reaction for somebody who has spent the better part of their entire career trying to fight for solutions to climate change. Uh, I turned to Facebook, as we do, uh, and I wrote that I didn't need to watch the president's speech because I was certain that this country was on an unstoppable path to a renewable energy future. I went on to talk about the cities and the mayors and the companies and the movement that was so strong, both in the United States and around the globe. Um, and so that was a pretty positive and optimistic response to a pretty soul-crushing and potentially earth-destroying event. Uh, and I, I got a lot of interesting responses from that Facebook post. Your optimism is nauseating. <laughs> are you that naive, Jesse? What are you smoking, Jesse? Um, and that caused a bit of reflection for me. Uh, I really pride myself on being a person full of optimism, on being a person that seizes not just the day, but the moment. Uh, and I think the truth is, for me, there is no other way that I can operate in this world. Um, and that's for some pretty real reasons. Um, 11 years ago, uh, as a 25-year-old, after months and months of being under the weather, a brilliant doctor at Johns Hopkins University figured out what was going on with me. And he looked me in the eye and he said, Jesse, um, it's not just cancer. You have an incredibly rare autoimmune disease. An autoimmune disease with no cure, an autoimmune disease that means your cancer is going to return, an autoimmune disease we're not sure how to treat. Uh, and I'm gonna send you to a bunch of specialists, but I want you to know that the road ahead doesn't look so optimistic. And those were exactly his words as a 25 year old. And I was at the prime of my life. I was building a kick-ass youth climate movement in this country. I was living in Washington DC among some of my greatest friends. And this doctor looked me in the eye and told me that that future was at risk in coming to an end. Oncologists after that, the news got worse. One oncologist actually had the nerve to look me in the eye and said, I want to be honest, it will be a miracle if you make it till 30. I would call, call that a relatively traumatic event. Uh, an event that wasn't traumatic just when I heard the news, but an event that remained traumatic, and I guess on some level remains traumatic in my life. Two bone marrow transplants later, eight rounds of chemotherapy at 36. Here I am, strong, and still in the movement. Thank you very much. <laughs> what I decided, and not all in one instance, upon receiving that news, was that the only way I was gonna be able to get up every day which, which would be to imagine a future in which I was healthy. Imagine a future in which my activism and my political fight could go on. Imagine a future in which I someday fell in love and had babies and a growing group of friends. I had to live in a positive future. There was no other place to live. So that brings us and me to the moment we're in today. Uh, I think it's safe to say that this country of ours, that all of us has gone through some pretty serious trauma. I think for some of us that trauma happened inside the Democratic primary. For some of us that trauma happened if you were a Republican when Donald Trump became your nominee. For some of us that trauma was election night. And for millions of us that trauma has happened day in and day out. It's happened by the behavior of this president. It's happened as we closed our borders. It's happened as we've infused terror and fear in our fellow citizens, as we've tried to revoke basic rights, access to health care, etc. But you might not be so surprised to hear 
that even in the midst of this trauma that we are experiencing, I kind of have some hope. I think that there's a real possibility. In fact, I think there's kind of no other choice than for us to come out of this moment having grown, having been stronger, more capable, more agile, more resilient than we've ever been before. Um, and I hope you all agree. So in the mid-90s, um, a bunch of very smart academics and psychologists coined a concept called post-traumatic growth. Can you raise your hand if you've heard about post-traumatic growth? We've heard a lot about post-traumatic stress. Post-traumatic growth is this idea that individuals or even communities and societies can experience horrific traumatic events and that it actually transforms and opens a psychological space for us to do things we would have never been capable of doing prior to that trauma happening. Now, it's not automatic. It's not like we're gunning to have traumatic events happen, because that will mean we are like capable to do the next biggest thing. It requires some real intentionality about how we process that trauma about what we're willing to acknowledge about that trauma happening. And I guess in reading about this concept of post-traumatic growth, both something that I feel like I've lived through personally, but I think is so applicable to our nation right now, I want to see our country be on a path. I want to see our movement be on a path to post-traumatic growth. And I think we have a lot of reason to believe the signs are already out there. Uh, I considered giving a PDF talk that was my love letter to the resistance, because I have to say I have been in awe of what has happened in this country. To be able to speak after the founders of Indivisible and Grab Your Wallet, to have the chance to engage with this year's youngest PDF speaker, who is the, the author of the resistance manual, to daily read the stories of Pantsuit Nation, um, this is some incredible stuff. This is post-traumatic growth in action. But not alone, because there's a bunch of really powerful, amazing, and some really broken existing institutions <laughs> that are a part of this collective. In my view, the post-traumatic growth is going to require a dialing down of ego, a dialing up of humility, of vulnerability, a recognition that we're going to try a whole bunch of things, basically out of our grief, out of our fear, out of the trauma we've experienced. And we're going to have to be willing to say when those things are working. And we're going to have to be willing to tell one another when those things have not worked and when we need to move on. If we don't have a movement that makes room for the thousands of indivisible groups across this country, if we don't have a movement that at its core is culturally based and motivated by tactics like grab your wallet, if we don't have political parties that recognize and honor some of what contributed to the trauma we all experienced, then I think this idea of post-traumatic growth is going to be a little tricky. But I have to see, say and see that when I look into the future, when I think not just about the outcome of the 2018 elections, or the outcome of the 22 elections, when I really look into that future, that future where I continue personally to defy all medical odds, where technology and research cures my problems, I also see a movement that is growing to heights that we can barely imagine right now. I believe that in this moment, post-trauma that we are all going through, we internalize and recognize what's at stake. We think of the tens of millions of Americans whose health insurance we have to fight like hell to keep. We think of the tens of millions of undocumented people in this country who absolutely deserve to be citizens of this great nation. We think and we feel and we internalize that this is an America where women will have every access, opportunity, benefit, health provision imaginable. This movement, all of you, you're going to make that happen. That's what 
post-traumatic growth is going to mean coming out of this devastating political year of 2016. I know that because this community, in various forms, the civic tech community, the web of change community what's here, the climate community that's here, you all have done tremendous things before. You have helped propel me through multiple medical disasters. It's important to remember we've won huge political victories in the past, but we're gonna have to be willing to work together. Uh, I gotta end this speech. Um, it, I would be remiss to not take the opportunity to acknowledge what used to always bring me to PDF. Uh, it's a little embarrassing, but uh, I only ever came to PDF so that my dear friend Jake Brewer and I could take the train home from PDF and drink way too many Sam Adams beers, um, convince one another that we had the single best idea to solve what was ever was happening in the country, to probably talk a little shit about who we'd seen or whose speech we liked or whose speech we didn't, uh, and it was beautiful. And two years ago, I would have never known that I took my very last train ride home with Jake from PDF. Um, so I won't be able to take that train ride home to Washington, D.C. with Jake tomorrow. And if I were taking that train ride home, I can be certain he would be telling me to seize the moment. I can be certain he would tell me he had a more brilliant idea than the next to solve this moment that we were in. Um, and I would be telling him, and in my last 20 seconds, this is my only pitch, I would be telling him about how excited I was to introduce him to an idea called hope. Yes, the mega idea called hope, but also meethope.us. So in place of my train ride home with Jake tomorrow, I ask you all to check out meethope.us. Uh, and I ask you to join me in being optimists, to thinking and believing that that brighter future is ahead of us, uh, and to knowing that together we can get there. Thank you so much.